You're listening to In Cap We Trust for the Always Next Year Podcast Studio Network. You can find the team on our Twitter at ANY Podcast or on our website, www.alwaysnextyearpodcast.com. And now, to bring us in, the Jack Dolls. A plain man I used to be, revered and feared through Killarney. Now I'm back, to hitching with the wind. But if Mickey Flynn should ever fight me, I'll throw me call a shit all behind me and square off on that son of a bitch again. He cracked up in a river too, he beat me so they through and through. And so she over my unconscious frame. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of In Cap We Trust here at the Always Next Year podcast. I'm your host, Shane, and I'm joined by Matt VC. Matt, am I saying your last name right? I meant to ask you prior. Yes, you are, sir. Perfect, perfect. Uh, Matt is a writer for Phillies Nation. Uh, I got to be honest. So when I first jumped back into Twitter, Matt, you were one of the first Phillies writer type followers that I had kind of began to follow. So this is super cool for me to have you on. So I appreciate it. Um, so I had to nerd out a little bit there for a moment. But uh, no how problem. are you today, sir? Good, good, good. How about yourself, Shane? Good to be on with you. I appreciate it. So uh, real quick, for all of my followers who don't yet follow you, which I have to at this point believe is very few considering how often uh, I retweet some of your stuff out there. Why don't you just let us know where we can find some of your work uh, for Phillies Nation, what that website is, and what your Twitter handle is. Sure. My Twitter handle uh, personally is at Matthew VZ. It's my full name. So it's M-A-T-T-H-E-W-V-E-A-S-E-Y, Matthew VZ. They can find uh, me at Phillies Nation. It's philliesnation.com on the web. If they want to go to me specifically, it's philliesnation.com slash author slash MVZ. And uh, those are easily the best places to reach me at this point. Uh, Phillies Nation is at Phillies Nation on both Twitter and Facebook, by the way. I did not even realize that goes to show you how often I use Facebook, but I did not realize you guys had a Facebook page as well. Um, but you put out articles, you know, a few times a week, it seems like at this point. Do you have anything that's uh, on the horizon that you can kind of peek into? We're uh, myself and the editorial director, Tim Kelly uh, from Phillies Nation, are going to be really keying on the build up to the trade deadline starting at this point. We we have a staff that write up game reports, pregame reports, postgame reports, and uh, a couple of other you know, specialty items, prospect reports and that kind of thing. So. The staff will be keen on those things, although um, Tim and I will still be having our hands in on that. But uh, you'll be seeing he and I really keying on the trade deadline. Any news that pops up, any rumors that we hear that the Phillies could be involved in, uh, we're going to try to cover that as best as possible. Perfect. We actually have a few to discuss later in the show that uh, reported a little bit today for rumor side. Um, but let's talk a little bit here about the first half uh, as a whole. So pre All Star break, uh, things went incredibly underwhelming i think had one of the things that i continue to say is it's been pretty impossible to have your finger on the pulse of the identity of this baseball team you know from from day to day this they they look completely completely different what is hot could then be cold first half big surprises certain things are underwhelming what is the one thing so far that has kind of stuck out most to you in that type of surprising category uh, you know, as much as we talk about the pitching, and the pitching is a problem, we'll get into that, I'm sure, at some point, but um, the inconsistency in the offensive attack has has surprised me. I think we had the large-scale changes to the everyday lineup in the off season that excited everyone for good reason, I believe, and the, especially when you think about the opening series against Atlanta, uh, they came out like a house on fire and it just looked like uh, we really had an exciting season ahead of us. And, and I, I just think that the, the number of times that they've been shut down as an offense, uh, there have been there have been plenty of games where they've scored six, seven, even double digits. I think they're on a pace already to go way past where they were last year in double digit run scoring games. But there have been so many games where they've been held down to one, two runs, that, uh, even three runs. You're not going to win 
a lot of games, scoring one, two, three runs. So uh, that's been the most frustrating thing to me, and I think the most surprising to me. Uh, the pitching hasn't surprised me as much. Yeah, I, I would say that the way that this offseason kind of constructed this baseball team, they were banking on that offense to score that six plus runs a night, you know, average that five and a half runs a night. You know, four seemed to be the magic number for this team through a, a big part of the first two months. And they would worry about the pitching at the deadline. They were hoping this offense could kind of hold over, you know, another trial run for the Pavettas and the Eflins and the Velasquezes. And it just hasn't worked out that way. What kind of things do you attribute that to? I, there are, to me, like I said, you can't put your finger on any sole individual thing right now that is kind of hampering this offense. I honestly, I absolutely agree with you. I don't think there's any one thing. I think you've had a number of the players have gone into, they've disappeared almost from productivity for weeks at a time at different times. So, you know, like for instance, you had Franco start out like a ball of fire, then he disappeared for a month, five weeks, uh, seems to be picking it up again. Um, I'm not picking on Michael. I actually like Michael Franco, but that's, that's the example to me. We've had Reese Hoskins who was hot for a while, disappeared, came back. It certainly has not helped the loss of Andrew McCutcheon. I think that was a big loss. I think it's a loss that we're going to appreciate more and more as the year goes along. I'm already appreciating it. I think everybody I is. And, you know, they lost him with, uh, you know, only two thirds of the first half haven't been played uh, 59 games in. So, you know, that was a huge loss. And took out their leadoff hitter, a uh, veteran presence in the lineup. It took them a while before they were able to, uh, you know, figure out what they wanted to do with the lineup. And I really don't think that they still have. Um, Odubel Herrera, that was a big, a big loss. And I don't mean that as far as the loss of him when we finally lost him for good, uh, which was bad enough, but sure. he never got it going. He was the starting center fielder from opening day. And he was hitting 222 with a 288 on base percentage and had one home run after the 39 games that he got to play. Injured part of that time, but that was a black hole in the lineup. Uh, so, you know, the the outfield has been uh, a real challenge. Uh, Jay Bruce, geez, what a, you know, what a f- – Fabulous pickup he turned out to be. He's breath of fresh air right now in this offense. Yeah, sure, and uh, but it's not what they they got him for. You know, they they got him for a need that they had, which was a power lefty off the bench, uh, maybe a, a couple of weeks, a couple of days a week starting, maybe give a blow here and there at first base to Hoskins. Uh, they were going to use him to bolster the bench and. Right after they got him or right around when they got him, they lose McCutcheon. And now Bruce has to start every day, which, you know, there are worse things that can happen than Bruce having to start every day. But that leaves you back to square one as far as your bench depth, which they pretty much had none of. Uh, The loss of Herrera, the inability of Herrera to contribute anything when he was healthy, and then the loss of McCutcheon, uh, that's really put them behind the eight ball. And when you compound that with – the other players in the lineup disappearing for weeks at a time. It's just been a, a, a bad mix to this point. Yeah, you, you, know, you kind of hit on two topics that, that we've discussed on, on this segment prior. The outfield as a whole, you know, so I was there the, the day before it was a documented day of uh, Andrew McCutcheon. It was the first player out on the field taking, you know, some, some different approach uh, of batting practice. So I was in the dugout that morning uh, for SI. And we're sitting there and, and we're, we're waiting to do a story on Andrew McCutcheon and the way that he carries himself in the dugout with people beyond just the players, just those who, who were there was something that I hadn't really seen from star players. And he, to that point, was, again, our probably our most crucial player on the field at any given time. I do believe that, you know, he, he's now back in the dugout with with the team. I, I think that for most home series, he will be there. Uh, I don't know yet if he's going to be on the road uh, with, with the team as as well. But I do think that that will help having his presence, which is something that you mentioned there. But another thing beyond Odubel Herrera's, you know, again, unfortunate circumstances that are following him at this point. 
the outfield, we didn't originally have enough spots for all of our should-be outfielders. We were talking Bryce Harper, Andrew McCutcheon, Odubel Herrera, the team's best player for three years, you know, leading into this season, was now going to be leading the charge of our second half of our lineup. Aaron Altair forgot how to play baseball. Nick Williams is a kind of a quad A type of guy. Roman Quinn, exciting, but ah. Eh. And we're now left with we have to call up a 21, 22 year old uh, Adam Adam Hazley and play Jay Bruce out there and left. That is a depth problem we should have never had to experience, and it's something that I, this team just hasn't been able to gain and gather its footing again. And it depletes that bench, and then you begin to see. The Sean Rodriguez is, you know, the Phil Goslins for the cup of coffee that he was here and Andrew Knapp in necessary pinch hitting situations. There's no depth to this team anymore in an area that we believed we had so much. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, you know, you said it all. I think that they, that they felt outfield depth coming in wasn't going to be an issue. Uh, it, like you said, if anything, we you? had too many, right. We had McCutcheon and Harper were on the corners were givens. Uh, Herrera in center field, I thought was going to have to, you know, fight. He was going to have to, he had something to prove coming into this season. Um, but he was the incumbent and rightfully so. But you also had Nick Williams who was going to fight for time. But we all knew Williams from reputation, from the coaching staff's uh, positions, from his usage in the past. He's a corner outfielder, Nick Williams. He's not going to play yes. center. So he's going to, he's going, he's not going to beat out McCutcheon or Harper. So he's the odd man out, the last guy on the bench, uh, first guy off the bench, if you will, in the outfield. And so center field was Odubel's, uh, Roman Quinn, who I have always believed was more talented than Odubel, raw talent. But Quinn's problem, we all, it's very well known now, he just cannot stay healthy. And you cannot count on him. I mean, if I see Roman Quinn make a great play like he did the other night, or I see him blaze around the bases, and the, the man has unreal speed. Um, when I see these tools on display, it just makes me shake my head that, you know, why couldn't we get lucky enough to have this guy also be somebody who we could rely on uh, day in and day out? Because I think we really see a dynamic leadoff man. But he, again, it's neither here nor there because he can't stay healthy and you can't count on him. And as you said, Altair just totally disappeared. I'm not opposed to, like when you say you know, we had to call up a 21, 22-year-old guy, Hazley. I'm not opposed to young guys getting a chance, especially in no, this I. day and age in Major League Baseball. I think that the guys 30-plus are really going to have to fight for it uh, anymore in, in this post-ped era. Uh, you're going <laughs> to see this is a game, all pro sports, if you look around it, it the games are gearing more and more towards 20 something players. And so a guy coming up at 22, 23, like like Alec Bohm is really blazing his way through the minors. Uh, uh, Advance a guy based on how he's performing. If he's performing, he's showing he can handle a level, advance him to the next. If he's showing he can perform at that next level, advance him to the next level. If a guy is 21 years old, like, you know, what was Ken Griffey Jr., 19, 19, 19 uh, Trout, 20, 21. I mean, if a guy can play, I'm not saying any of our guys are Trout or Harper <laughs> or, or Junior, but the point being that you see teams like the Braves have guys who are 20, 21. The Nationals had Soto last year come in at 19 years old, uh, 20 years old, and be the runner-up to the Rookie of the Year. You had Okuna, who was uh, like 2021 win Rookie of the Year. Uh, guy being 21, 22, he's only a year out of college. I could care less. If the guy can play and he's better than what you have here now, then get him here. Make room for him. Put your best team on the field. So uh, the Hazley thing doesn't bother me at, at, at age as much as I didn't really know that he was ready for the big leagues. He jumped from double A to triple A to the majors in an emergency basis. And I don't think that he really was, a had been a standout prospect. You know, he was a good prospect, but um, I don't know that he's more than a, a, for me, a temporary stop, stop gap in center field. I think he still has a lot to prove before he can show he's much more than that. He certainly does. The one thing that's followed Hazley, and I'm a big Hazley guy you know, is the fact that he has hit at every single level that he's been at. He hasn't really had, outside of the, the way he kind of started this year at AA, both he and Moniak both kind of started slow and picked up. 
he has hit at every single level. And I do genuinely believe that his hit tool is something that's going to carry him and keep him on a roster. I believe that there's power that is not yet unlocked from him and, and true ability to drive the baseball in a major league park is kind of the biggest question mark for him. But I certainly believe he can hold his own for the time being, uh, again, out of necessity at this point for the Phillies out in, in center field. Uh, and he, you know, his bat, even off the bench that to me, I, I agree with Kapler when he states this, you know, about his young guys, if they're here, they're going to play. It serves yeah. no purpose to have these guys on the bench. Um, but if he's going to be out there splitting time a little bit, you know what? I do believe him to be mature enough being that he did go to those three years at Virginia, a very good school. Uh, you know, he is a little bit more seasoned than the 19 and 20 year olds that typically would come up. He has played against that type of caliber of competition. And sure. That's something I certainly respect with Hazley. Well, you know, he had se- he only had 78 plate appearances at Lehigh Valley, which and, and he would have gotten more uh, if McCutcheon would have stayed healthy. And oh, for if sure. we didn't run into all the center field problems that we ran into, he certainly would have gotten, you know, two, maybe 300 you know, plate appearances. And we, we might not even he might not have even debuted in the major leagues at this point. But, um, hey, he's here. He's shown he can hold his own. Uh, like you said, he has hit at every level. So uh, he had 26 extra base hits. I'm, I'm looking at his numbers now and 268 plate appearances between double and triple A. So, you know, he has the ability. You know, it's just a question of he could have used He definitely could have used a little more seasoning, a little more, uh, a few more at bats against major league caliber, which you see a lot in triple A. Um, or just below it, major league caliber tr- pitching. So I would have liked to have seen him get a, at least a couple hundred more plate appearances against them. But situation is what it is, and uh, I, I like him better than Odubel at this point. So, <laughs> so let's see what happens. It's tough, man. I, I was a huge Adubel supporter, you know, obviously prior to, to all of the things that have now been made known. Uh, you know, again, unfortunate things about his character. Um, but uh, I always love uh, to me, I, I always likened him to, to a Shane Victorino type of player. He was kind of baseball stupid, but you did love his aggressive when he, his aggression when he showed it. And there were things that didn't make sense that worked out for him for so long. And I, I think it was Pete McCann who said, you know, he could hit over 300 every year. And, and I genuinely believe he probably could have. Um, so it is a damn shame out there, that center field situation. And, and a guy who, like I said, was the Phillies best player for three years, if your best player of, of a three-year rebuild is now hitting six or seven for you. It's a pretty damn good lineup, and it's just not the way it is right now. Yeah. And because of that, it places an inordinate amount of stress on a very lacking of talent starting rotation. We all came into this season w- with Aaron Nola, you know, again, freshly off that new new contract. That there's new dollars to, to him and a ton of credit to him. You know, he's really pitched his way out of a, a not so good start of the season. And he's starting to look again over these last five, six starts like Aaron Nola. But you had actually written a piece on Jake Arrieta a few weeks ago that really clashed with what social media's view of Jake Arrieta was. And it actually fascinated me, the article that you had written kind of in support of his season being not quite as bad as, you know, as we all make it out to be. I don't know what it was like for you, but I know that this offseason, knowing that he had to go through the surgeries that he went through and that he was pitching the second half of last year, not healthy. One of our guys at AMYP, LJ, had projected him to lead the Phillies in wins. The Phillies desperately needed a very good season from Jake Arrieta. And the fact that we haven't gotten that and the fact that he's now hurt again in a place that and again, this is something he's pitched with before back in Baltimore. This has to be incredibly alarming, especially considering the quad A talent that is behind him. We have nothing left that we can throw out there that's better than Jake Arrieta at 85%. What kind of things do you need to see from him and from the Phillies and how they manage him over the second half of this season, assuming that he continues to pitch through this? You know, that's a good question. Uh, you know, my defense of Arietta in the beginning came from, A, his his record, you know, the record that he put together over the last few years and his experience level, which no one else in the staff possessed. And he got off to a start that, that had me vindicated. I was feeling pretty good. Yeah, as, was as, as we got to the end of April, uh, his first five starts were all uh, quality starts. Started missing uh, bats again. I think six of his first seven were quality starts. And then uh, he had a couple of hiccups in early May, but then he bounced back with a couple more good starts. So 
you know, I, I was okay with Arietta through maybe the end of May, but he had a start uh, when the whole team for me seemed to really turn to the negative. He had a, a terrible start in the midst of that Dodger series in LA yes. uh, to end May. He got just got creamed over five innings and that started a streak of probably something like six out of seven starts where he just was, he was pitching innings. I mean, he was going into the, uh, a lot of times he made it to the sixth inning, but he was getting every night. He was getting beat up pretty much. I think he had one good start out of maybe a seven or eight start stretch through the whole end of May, even all the way through June into the beginning of July. So, uh, he just fell apart. Now, if he fell apart because he was just struggling because of his, his injury situation that we weren't aware of uh, maybe, you know, early in the season when he was still fresh, you know, he was able to get through it more, but the more he threw the worse it got. That's what he's said. I mean, he just said that when he came over to the all-star break, when it, uh, more information came out about the injury, he said the more that he pitches with it, the worse it gets. And his last start, Start out against the Nationals. He pitched really well. Five innings, gave up four hits, only one earned run. I think they got him. Maybe that's what they're looking at. A five inning, him becoming a five inning pitcher tops. Uh, but if they can get, if they can somehow keep him healthy as a five inning pitcher over the second half, the entire second half of the season, I think that's probably the the best that we can hope for for it point knowing what his medical condition is um and if the majority of those five inning starts can be starts of the type that we just saw him throw against the nationals then i'm fine with him being in the rotation but that's not a number two starter which is where he is at this point or allegedly is that's a back-end starter giving you five innings so nola on the front end uh, no, uh, Arietta on the back end until he breaks down and God forbid, hopefully he doesn't break down, um, uh, Eflin somewhere in the middle, but outside of that, I think it's a real toss up. And I think they really need to, if they want to make a run this year, they need to find two better starting pitchers. I agree. You know, we, we went into this season with, as I continued to say, four question marks behind Nola. We didn't know what we were going to get front from Jake Arrieta because we don't know who he is anymore as a pitcher coming off of last year's injuries. And then the, the other three guys were, you know, guys who put together at various points in their short major league careers, very good stretches, but also very, very bad stretches. We didn't know. And now we are in a place where if you needed to keep one or two of them, okay, but we cannot continue to throw out there through a five man rotation week in and week out through the dog days of August and September, trying to get into a postseason berth with Pavetta, Eflin, and Velasquez all throwing the way that they've been throwing inconsistently all year. So I do genuinely believe that uh, uh, out of necessity, they have got to find a creative way to, to attack this deadline and to, to find a, a serviceable, you know, even a couple, find a couple threes. I don't need it to be a true number two at this point. I just need someone to go out there that can be a true major league pitcher. And that's something that we've lacked for quite some time here uh, in Philadelphia beyond, again, Aaron Nola. So uh, the, the rotation right now is, is uh, again, probably the biggest talk point for and the biggest discussion uh, for all of social media and sports talk radio and, you know, whoever's within the Phillies organization attacking this trade deadline. So we'll be interested to see some of the pieces that you guys come out since uh, you and your, your uh, editor over there at Phillies Nation are going to be putting together some of those things. So, again, for our followers and listeners, be sure to follow uh, Phillies Nation over there and follow Matt over there. Another thing on the first half right now that that's constantly coming under scrutiny, and this is something that absolutely drives me mad, so I can't speak on this too, too much right now because I'll lose it. But there is an insane amount of scrutiny towards managers, whether it's Gabe Kapler, whether it's Chris Young, whether it's John Malley, as well as some towards the front office and, of course, some towards the players. Do you think that the amount of, of scrutiny towards Gabe Kapler and his staff is warranted at this point? Or do you think that there are just so many circumstances that, you know what, I, who could do better with what we have? Well, let, let's, let's put it this way, you know, realistically, the, there's the oldest saying, right. In sports, you can't fire all the players. 
know, you fire the manager, right? Now, I don't necessarily subscribe to that. Uh, the first part, obviously, you can't just clean house of all the players, and you certainly don't want to do that with the, with the Phillies, although there are a handful of players that could go, and I wouldn't be sitting in the corner crying over them. But <laughs> uh, Kapler, for me, he hasn't won me over totally, but he hasn't lost me either. Uh, for me, the jury's still out on Gabe Kapler. I think that's And fair. I think that – it should be. Yeah, he's he hasn't won anything yet. Uh, he had a team last year that through the more than the middle of the summer uh, into early August was in first place and looked like a surprising cont- what well, was a surprising contender at that point. And I didn't think that their talent was anywhere near oh, the level that they were playing. So I gave Kapler a lot of credit at that point for at least – what was happening on the field, um, whatever you want to feel about his personal style or the way that he uh, delivers, handles himself in, an, in his delivery in post game or uh, whether you think he's a little too positive. You know, the, uh, I'm not worried about all that. You know, you weren't hearing anything, any grumblings or gripings coming from the players in the locker room and the team was winning. Now, that didn't continue. So. To look at the team over the last, you know, from this, from that time last year, last August through right now in, in July, they're a losing team. And that's two different teams. That's kind of two different lineups. It's really the same pitching, but it's mostly uh, uh, the manager and this coaching staff uh, is where the continuity has been. And I don't see positive steps forward, even though the lineup has changed. So I'm not saying right now is the time to make a change. I really don't believe that. But I think after the season is over, to look at under a microscope and say, are we really advancing? Uh, Are our pitchers moving forward the way we want to see a staff move forward? Are the hitters as a group producing the way we want them to? So far, the answer is no. And how long do you keep going with the same stuff? Somebody, somebody's head's going to roll. I think at some point, unless there's a turnaround, criticism is warranted. I think, but um, I don't think now's the time to be making those changes. Some are calling for heads. I don't think now's the time. So I, I kind of agree and kind of don't. The one thing that I continue to challenge our listeners and followers to to kind of put in perspective is the fact that the rest of baseball has had the last decade to catch up to what baseball truly is now and to what they always envisioned it to be over the course of this last decade. Our player development was not that, you know, um, you know, uh, Ruben Amaro Jr. was not that. And they waited and waited. And what we're now implementing, we're trying to implement over the course of a year and a half vert where, where all these other teams had, like I said, a decade to do this. So, a lot of our homegrown talent is where I sit there and say, you kind of have a pass. Like, I get this. But some of the guys who have come from other systems, you know, when you take a look at JT not being quite as sexy as we envisioned, you know, at the plate, not saying he's having a bad season. He certainly is not. But I think that he's been slightly underwhelming to what we believed. When you take a look at Gene Segura, a guy who's over the last three years going into the All-Star break, I think he was averaging hitting around 310, 315 hitting 265, 268 or something going into the, into the All-Star break. There are certain players here where I look at and say, well, the Phillies haven't really had enough time to sit there and get their hands on you and screw you up. That's kind of concerning for the individual player. But I think as a whole right now, they're so far behind things that I genuinely believe they do have to kind of ride this thing out. I think if you're going to make a move to appease the fan base, which I do believe is something organizations – do and they're not naive to what is being said about them and about their organization it may be a john malley because of the inconsistencies of this offense and the fact that success has not typically followed him and his stays are not typically that long outside of that uh chicago world series team obviously uh and then chris young maybe they made a mistake you know maybe they made the mistake keeping young versus Kranitz. you know those are questions and debates that you can have possibly one of those go The thing that I think you risk is if you move on from either the hitting coach or the pitching coach right now and things still don't get better, that almost assuredly means the end of Gabe Kapler in this offseason. And to me, I'm not ready to give up yet, considering all of the circumstances that we've been dealt. 
I think that he deserves next year as well. But again, a lot's going to be, I think it's very fair what you said, the jury's still out on him for you. I think it should be for the rest of the fan base as well. So I think that's well said. Well, this is why I think that Kapler, uh, I remember, in my opinion, we threw in the towel too quick and the fan base buried uh, Terry Francona way too fast. Oh, I agree. This is a guy who, if you remember, you know, how well Michael Jordan spoke of Terry Francona when he had him in the minor leagues, Mm -hmm. uh, that that always made an impression on me because Michael Jordan is not an easy guy to impress. Um, And he was impressed by by Terry Francona. So when we brought Francona on board, I was looking forward to it. Now, if you remember that time in the late nineties, the, the Phillies had a handful of players and the organization really put nothing, invested nothing into trying to go for a contending team, trying to build up a contending team. They were, they were trying to build, uh, bring down that team's talent level, if you will, to make everything look uglier. In my opinion, this is what was going on to try to, Everything was geared towards getting a new ballpark in Citizens Bank Park and damn the roster. Now, <clears throat> Francona had to operate under that w- with that type of a personnel um, process going on around him and above him. And I just think that we turned the page too fast from him. And here you see what happened. He got some got players. He got in a good situation with an organization that cared and he wins a couple of World Series. <clears throat> And he's been one of the best managers in baseball for a decade and a half now, almost made for the AL, <clears throat> I think, but I do agree. And I think that, I think that he would have grown and been a fine manager, you know, in the NL too, but you know, we'll, we won't know maybe that, but um, the point is, we, I, I don't think, I think it's too soon. Obvious to me, it's obvious. It's too soon to throw in the towel on Gabe Kapler. He's, he's, he's definitely, Definitely the manager for this season. And then what I think you do is, if I'm the GM anyway, <clears throat> we sit down uh, in the off season, which I know they will. This is part of their process, and they'll look at everything. How did we perform? Did we under? Did we overperform? And if my evaluation as the GM is that the hitting coach and the pitching coach and or have to go, then I'm going to tell Kapler. I'm going to say, look, you know, this just didn't work out. This isn't, and we got to make a change. And you got to be willing to make a change. If he's not willing to make, I, I don't, I can't see Kapler being the type of a guy who says who's married to his hitting coach or his pitching coach. He's he's the kind of guy who's willing to say, if you show him black and white, you know the numbers, this isn't working. Then maybe it's time, and maybe we have somebody else out here who can do a better job, or you know we think is uh, a better fit, you know, for our organization. Then let's make a change. Uh, You're still going to be the manager, Gabe. Let's make a change. And if next year, you know, we get guys in who are different under him and there's still no change and the attitude on the team still is kind of like blasé in middle of the road and we're having another 500s type season where we're struggling along, then maybe, maybe it isn't, maybe part of it is is, uh, Kapler. But it's not this year. This year can't be... Uh, it's a, it can't, his job can't be based on this year. I think you're absolutely right. He gets through this year. He's got to come back next year. And in the off season, we look at the coaches together. Yeah, I think that's completely fair. And one thing that would help make his job that much easier is to enhance the personnel that he has available to him because he has not had a bench all year. Not necessarily, you know, the, the organization's fault entirely their reaction to the things that have happened has been not great uh, or at least slow moving uh, outside of the the Jay Bruce move. Um, But they can help him out and they can begin at this deadline. So obviously you're going to be writing pieces about this and you're going to be sitting here and commenting on different rumors and different things of the sort. But the next 17 games are going to be incredibly telling for the direction that this franchise is going to go. McPhail's comments were, you know, left a lot to be desired. You know, that was not the most positive thing to hear if you were a Phillies fan. Gabe Kapler wants tools to be able to use. He wants major league pitchers. He wants better util or better pieces on his bench. Let's just say they play 500 or better ball during this stretch leading into the trade deadline. If you are in that front office, what direction do you take? Are you a buyer? Are you a seller? Are you kind of hybrid there? I am, I'm, I, I'm going to answer this as me now, as Matt VZ <laughs> writing for Phillies Nation, but I'm also going to answer it as I believe that I would act if I were 
in the general manager's chair, and that is that I'm a buyer right now. <clears throat> My team is right now holds a wild card position. I'm not just going to give that up. Uh, I look around at the rosters on the other wild card teams, and except for the Nationals, who I I really think they're a very talented ball club, and I think what you saw over the first seven weeks from them was an aberration. Uh, I think you're seeing their real talent show up over the last seven or eight weeks. As do I. So, uh, fine, give them, let them and the Braves battle it out, and they got a wild card. But there's a second wild card that is up for grabs. And <clears throat> when people say, oh, yeah, but you're not going to go very, very far in October, you don't know that. It's you one game this. that you had. Well, it's one game that you have to play, too, in a wild card. Anything can happen in one game. You know, you're, you're a pitcher. You could have Max Scherzer for the Nationals pitching, and the Phillies might, based on who they had to use right before that, have to throw Zach Eflin in the wild card game. And Zach Eflin might pitch the game of his life. Or maybe Scherzer's a little off. Maybe Harper hits a couple home runs off him. You know, anything can happen in one game. So, And then you're into a series. Now, anybody who plays a series right now against the Los Angeles Dodgers is going to have their hands full. I mean, let's be honest. That's sure. a really super talented, deep team in their lineup, on their bench, and in their pitching staff. That's a complete team, and that is, uh, they're well-equipped to win a third straight National League championship and go to the World Series. <clears throat> but, we you know, again, you don't know what's going to happen. Injuries, a couple of off games. We've all seen upsets in the playoffs before. So I, I think with the money that you've invested – and the, the the emotion that you invested the fan base in coming into this season, and you're holding a wild card spot right now, you have to go for it. You have to. Uh, now, I'm not saying you're not going to trade Alec Bohm. There's no way. Uh, you're not going to trade maybe Spencer Howard. You know, there, there, there may be two or three pieces, but there are other deals to be had out there. Like you said, maybe you go for a couple of more proven veteran number three. Three types instead of that, you know, uh, ace number two type. Somebody who can be a, a Joe, what a Joe Blanton was in the second yeah. half of the Phillies in 2008. Just somebody who's going to go out and give you 10 or 12 really good quality, you know, professional outings from here to the end and keep you in that race, you know, so you're not uh, constantly getting, uh, you know, having to play from behind in these games. So, you look for a couple of cheap bench pieces, you know, to pick up. Now they just signed Logan Morrison as a free agent. I think that's a, a heads up si- uh, signing. Absolutely. I'm not sure what he's going to end up being. I don't know how fast he's going to be ready, but he is a, he's a legitimate left-handed bench bat with pop. Uh, he's the what kind Bruce of thing that was yes, brought in for. Exactly. It's just what I was about to say. Exactly. So, uh, you know, who knows how it'll pan out, but on the surface, that's a good move. So there are these kinds of moves to be had out there. And, you know, hopefully the, some of the, the arms like Robertson or somebody else can, can get back in here to help the back end of the bullpen. Uh, maybe you can find a bullpen piece. That's not, you know, the, the most sexy bullpen piece, but that's an effective one, effective moves. That's what they need three or four really key under the radar, effective moves, if you can get that one big, you know, arm, uh, uh, if you can get a Stroman, if you can get a you know, Robbie Ray at a reasonable cost, but that's going to be tough because you, you have seven, eight other teams, high powered teams with a lot of assets like the Yankees who are going to be at going after these same targets. So it's going to be very hard to get the more high profile guys. You try for it, but uh, <clears throat> those smarter, you know, Lower profile moves could be just what you need to solidify your roster enough to get into the playoffs. This this needs to be a playoff team in my mind. I agree. You, know, you take a look back at the at the birth of the last kind of core that we had. They needed 07. You know, they needed the playoff experience. They needed that taste. They needed to know what it was like to lose in the postseason too, which is what will happen this year, regardless of move. I think they're not going to compete 
with the Dodgers, but that in, that experience is invaluable. That learning that you get from losing is invaluable. And guys like Hoskins, guys like Kingery, even guys like Harper right now, they all need that growth potential. They all need that. And then the fan base needs it. You can't spend half a billion dollars in this offseason. And then when it comes time to then be buyers, say, mm, I think we're, we're out of it. We're going to not. What does that tell your fan base? That's a terrible, terrible look for your front office. So I 100% agree with you. I, I also would buy. I would buy using certain players on the roster right now, too. Personally, I if you can find – if Hazley proves to be an effective everyday outfielder and he can man center field, not that Cesar is going to command a lot, but if he may be something to put in a deal, especially for a bullpen arm, if – you know, if Tommy Hunter doesn't come back, if Robertson doesn't come back, if Nishak and his fragile state don't come back, you know, those are all those uncertain things. But you could move on from a Cesar. You could theoretically move on from a from a Mike Allen, especially knowing that Bohm theoretically is around the corner. No matter what the you need to do at this off or at this trade deadline, you should be putting your you should be telling your fan base and you should be telling that clubhouse we want to compete. We want postseason baseball. We need meaningful summer baseball in Philadelphia that we have not had in half a decade. To me, going in with, with any other mindset is the incorrect one. Sure. Now, and if you look at this roster, uh, the the value, as you said, of of getting to the playoffs and, and even if they lose, you know, having that experience. But this outside of Harper, who we all know he went there, you know, most years with the nationals and they fell short some, a couple times in the NLCS, but there is, there isn't a lot of postseason experience here. Even like real yep. Mudo came from the Marlins guys like Hoskins and, uh, um, uh, Nola, you know, are, are really key guys. A guy like Hector Neris, these people have never pitched or played in that playoff atmosphere. Uh, they need to get there. And experience not only what it's like in October playing in a playoff game or in a playoff series, but experience that September stretch run where you where you're battling for it against, you know, one or two other teams and you come out on top, whether coming out on top means winning that second wild card. That's that's enough that that lets you know, hey, we can do this. You know, we're we're a playoff team. You know, and going into next year, then that's something to build off of. They go in knowing, hey, we're a playoff team, you know, as an organization, as ball players. Now you're like, let's let's take the next step. Yeah, it's validation that this offseason did make sense and that the five hundred million dollars that they put in was worth it. And that some of the prospects given up the six of Sanchez's was the correct decision in that moment. And I think that validation is important, not only for those players, but certainly for the fan base here, again, that has been starved of playoff baseball for so long. The entire experience, no matter where you're looking at it from, like I said, fan, player in that clubhouse, member of the front office, what have you, it's invaluable. The experience that meaningful September and October baseball will bring. And I think it needs to happen this year. And I think you're hundred percent correct. And with that approach, is there any outside of the Bowman Spencer Howard were the two that you mentioned are there any other prospects for you right now that you would deem kind of untouchable? I, I, I don't, I don't have any uh, prospects that are untouchable in the Phillies. Now I'd rather they didn't trade Mickey Moniak. Cause I still believe, I, uh, love I still Mickey believe Moniak. that Moniak is going to be a player. Now I, I'm not positive of that. I believe it. I like what I've seen of his progression. Moniak is a, you know, p- people forget like every, Oh, he was a number one pick. He yeah, was the 18. first overall pick. Yes, exactly. He's going to be, he's only going to be 23, 24 years old in like 2021. So, you exactly. know, Boniac seems to me the way, when the way I'm reading his progression, he's a one level at a time guy. He needs to play at that level and acclimate himself at that level. And what we saw last year at the high A level, he started off slow, but then he really kicked yep. in the second half. Here he is now. He's at double A. Started off slow the first month. He was he looked like lost again in April. Since May started, boom, he's been great for the last two and a half months. Um, and literally great. I mean, his average has been high, hitting extra base hits, oh, uh, yeah. scoring runs. So he's a player. So you're starting to see that Mickey Moniak, for me, over the last calendar year, you're finally starting to see that 
this is this guy's a ball player. And now, this is the first time for like this is the very first time he's playing at his age level in three years. Right. It, he is now finally like 21, 2021. That's double A. Mm-hmm. He's he was playing ahead of schedule. He took a bit, and I think that you know station by station kind of approach for him is the correct one for all the reasons you've just said. And he's still young. I mean, he, like you say, he's 21, but he's you know there's a lot of there are a lot of college kids you know playing at double A. Uh, the best t- team's best prospects overall are playing at double A. Yes. So Moniac to me, I'm fine with his development, and I'd rather not deal him. And if I'm dealing him. That's going to be my guy that I'm dealing in uh, some kind of really high caliber starting pitcher who isn't a rental. Yeah. You know, maybe guy. then I got to think about it. But uh, that, that that's that's a maybe I, I swallow hard on Mickey Money. <laughs> Medina, <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to deal Adonis Medina. I don't believe in Medina. I'm whatsoever. willing to deal a guy like Luis Garcia, who is ranked highly by a lot of people, but he's. To me, he's light years away. He's only 18 years old. Bryson Stott's uh, going to be here. Reality of that situation. Yes. You yeah. know, it's you make a they're decision not on deal one. Bryson Stott. Well, exactly. I don't think they're going to. They're going to. They're not going to be dealing him. They just drafted him. I don't see them. I'm not saying he's untouchable. Which, but I'm which he, makes Luis Garcia that much more movable and exactly. attractive. And those arms, the other arm, if anybody wants. Daniel De Los Santos, Jojo Romero, Francisco Morales, Ranger Suarez. If you want any of those guys, God bless, take them. If you like <laughs> Jalen Ortiz power, uh, take Jalen Ortiz. If you want Cole Irvin, you, let, let's talk. You know, who who is it that you know you're giving me? So I mean there are a lot of good looking prospects. These aren't the top prospects in yeah, baseball. They're not blue chip prospects, but they're no. serviceable. Yes, and they're and they're guys with upside still. They're guys who are have some attractiveness attached to them. And so, when I see the deals that come down at the deadline, sometimes and I I just shake my head at the the underwhelming packages that teams gave up at times to get quality players. And uh, the Phillies have some underwhelming packages to offer, <laughs> but, you know, t- t- to me, you know, uh, I agree. guys look, you know, they have things though, that, that you can sell about them. You know, they've, they've had a taste of, they've shown some uh, ability in the minor leagues they've, or some of the guys like De Los Santos or, uh, or um, Suarez, they've had a taste of the big league. So they kind of know what it's like. Uh, that's a selling point, you know, on them. They didn't necessarily produce here, uh, but, They've got experience. They've had some success at the AAA level. They've had a taste of the big leagues. They can pitch in relief, and they can pitch as a starter in the back end if you need them to. There are things you can sell about, you know, these guys. So, uh, you know, you never know when your package might be, you know, the yeah. good package to land that big player. One of the things that I, I constantly talk about with some of the guys just off show, just in regular conversation, is the fact that you should be targeting GMs right now who are – are willing to have a conversation about quantity versus quality. You know, we took five or six guys in a Cole Hamels deal. Now, again, that, that was aided by the fact that we believed Jorge Alfaro was the catcher of the future. And Nick Williams was a former second round pick, you know, with some serious upside. And uh, Jake Thompson was coming off of, uh, you know, a really nice year over there as well. You know, but you take a look at a deal like that and, and you're like, well, we got five or six guys. We need someone to be able to sit there and say, hey, I will take five or six of your guys. You mix in a couple, you know, low A guys that, you know, you're taking a, a low risk on right now, but that reward could be high. You know, what? kind of like what we did with Papelbon and Pavetta. We didn't know what we had, but you take a shot on something like that. That's kind of what you should target. You should target some of these teams that are in mass rebuild mode of youth and they need that influx of, of 19, 20, 21 year olds who are interesting. That's the teams you got to target. In sure. And, sure. And you and I sitting here talking on a on a uh, you know podcast. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, not to be little what we're doing, but we you know we're educated fans uh, more maybe more so than the average fan. And uh, uh, it's easy for you and me to talk. But we have to know that you know Matt Clentak is, is doing these things. I mean, that's sure. his job. So I'm sure every day he's going into the office. You know, he's got to be looking over rosters, looking over minor league systems, you know, making contacts, calling people. The deadline is just over 
two weeks away. I mean, literally 15, six, days, 15 days away. Yeah. So that's, that's all he can be doing right now. And I mean, unless somebody's in his ear from above, like McPhail saying, giving him some marching Stand orders. Of, you're, yeah. You're not allowed to do this or that or the other thing. Uh, if that's the case, uh, I'd say fire Andy McPhail. Um, I'm not necessarily <laughs> against that anyway. I'm, I'm, I am not. He is an Andy very McPhail unlikable. Adherent. Yeah, I, I really, I don't know if if John Middleton is just sold on McPhail's, you know, the McPhail name. Um, you know, I really don't know History what it is, it. but. Who knows? I, 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 I'm not personally sold on Andy McPhail and not just that he's not likable, but he, you can't say what he just said publicly. It's, it all, it sounded it, to the fan base. I can just tell you by what I read and I'm sure you read the same kinds of comments on the internet. It was really taken in a negative fashion by the fan base. Oh yeah. And you can't be saying that you've got to be saying, look, you know what your public statement should be is look, we're going to do everything that we can to bring a winner to the Phillies. And we're going to do, if we can get to the playoffs this year, we're going to try our hardest to do that. And you could do what you need to do behind closed doors, That's you know, exactly but your public right. message has to be a lot more positive than his was. So it's crazy to me because when he said all of that, you know, like that genuinely could be what they, what they believe right now and what's going on in that front office. We, I, we don't know, you know, that, that negative light of, Oh, maybe the season's kind of too far gone at this point. But we're all now all wishing that he essentially responded in the ways that Gabe Kapler does, which is the same thing that we hate when Kapler does, or that not that I personally hate. I love Gabe Kapler, but that fan base does. But that just goes to show you that that positivity and that just influx of like confidence is something that even still will go over significantly better than saying a message in the way that McPhail just did. And especially the tone that he gave it in. It was so just monotonous and just, ah, I'm, I'm kind of done. Like this yeah. season's kind of over and that's, I'm not ready to white flag it right now. You mentioned it. We're, you know, we're in a wild card position or on the border of it. You got to continue to attack those needs. So um, <clears throat> we'll obviously, again, you, you know, we're encouraging our people to sit here and follow your work over there at Phillies nation on the trade deadline. I'm sure you guys will have a ton of pieces uh, that, that come out that follow those rumors. And then when deals finally and inevitably, hopefully, get completed let's go to just a few just second half predictions that you may have right now based on the things that you've seen over the course of the first half or maybe just some gut feelings that you have let's kind of bring in some positive well i hope they're positive anyway (laughs) Um, they very well may not be but uh for the sake of the show let's hope they are um let's get some of your uh second half predictions and some things that we can look forward to all right i uh, again things that i will would like to see happen, I think would be more appropriate than predictions because predictions, I, I think, and to predict anything with this team, this is one of the most <laughs> unpredictable teams that I've seen in years. But what I'd like to see, what I believed, I believed in my heart uh, all along since they started struggling at the end of May, that at some point for about a three or four week stretch, we were going to see Bryce Harper and Reese Hoskins get hot together at the same time and just start terrorizing the league as a three and four hitter combination. Uh, I still believe that that's in there. They're not having a bad season. Uh, Harper's got 40 extra base hits already. Uh, Hoskins has 42, 43, something like 44. So they're both over 40 extra base hits. Um, I think that that's, I think that's good production out of those guys, but I think they're capable of more than that. And I think that in most seasons, we're going to see Harper and Hoskins together for another four or five years. And if they extend Hoskins, you know, maybe six or seven years together. Um, At some point, we're going to see these guys have monster year or two together. I think that they have that hot run at the same time together and something like that out of your three, four hitters really clicking, really uh, terrorizing a menacing pitcher, pitching staffs that can carry a team to a winning stretch. So I really believe that at some point where I have a hard time believing we won't see Harper and Hoskins get hot together at the same time. So that's like my number one, I think, uh, from, I think that would be the from number within. one that 
everyone wants to hear. Yeah, and from within the the talent base that's here already, I think that's the 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 most likely thing. The, the other thing that I would like to see, you kind of touched on it, which was moving on from Caesar. Anybody who's you know followed me on social media, there's probably if there's anybody listening right now at any point to this podcast who follows me on social media and who disagrees with me right now, they're going, oh, here we go. But <laughs> I have been deal Caesar since the start of last year. And it's mostly because I'm a big Scott Kingery guy, but I'm a big Scott Kingery second baseman guy. <clears throat> Scott Kingery was the double a gold glove award winner at second yep. base in 2017 mm-hmm. when he had his big offensive year. Now he's been in a slump now Kingery for about pff, three, weeks. three weeks, but he was, you know, we saw offensively what he can do at the plate uh, over the first, you know, six weeks, seven weeks of the season when he was healthy. <clears throat> That's the Scott Kingery that I believe you're going to see most of the time when he is an everyday starter. And I believe he, you, he, he needs to be given the respect that every 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 other everyday player is given. Give him his position. Kingery's a second baseman, 25 years old. It's time to make him the everyday second baseman for the next five years or so and leave that position alone. Hoskins, Kingery on the right side of the infield. I'm shopping C- Cesar Hernandez. I would have done it by now, but I'm, I'm doing it aggressively at this trade deadline. So a hope for me, a hope for me is that Kingery's the second second baseman no later than August 1st for the next and after that for the next five years six seven years um, so and then I got Hoskins Kingery Segura Michael in the infield I'm fine with that infield uh, Real Muto behind the plate I am absolutely fine with all that until you know Bohm is ready and which that may not be until September or next year and if that's the case then then I got Michael as trade bait at that point sure uh, but that's my, you know, that's probably my second thing. Now on the infield, I apologize to you. On the pitching staff, uh, we, you have to bring in a couple of arms. Um, and here we're on management, not on the team. Uh, management just has to bring in a couple of more starters. If they don't, and if we have to keep running out, besides Nola, if we have to keep running out a, a five inning, if we're lucky, Arietta with Eflin, Pavetta, Vinny, maybe a couple of guys promoted from the minors over the last two and a half months, they're just not going to make the wild card. They'll be fortunate to finish 500 if they keep rolling that kind of pitching out. So I think the management needs to step up and find the two starting pitchers. The, they need to make the change at second base. And then, you know, I, I want to see Harper and Hoskins get hot together. Those are the things that I'm really looking for. Yeah, and I think those are, you know, three, you know, three things that the fan base is a majority is looking for, you know, and your first point, you know, in particular, you you don't make the kind of investment in in a player that has the kind of pedigree that Bryce Harper has and go into it thinking, and I am 100% fine with the season he has had, but fine isn't the word that I would have expected or am excited to use when describing a Bryce Harper season. I expect that period of time where he is carrying this offense. He is carrying this team. And we haven't really seen that yet. Uh, Hoskins is someone who's been notoriously streaky at almost every level. So I almost kind of expect this streakiness. But when he gets hot, damn, it would be a wonderful, wonderful thing to have a 3-4 combo right there. And that's going to make Real Muto that much more deadly at the plate. Uh, and may really unlock that that extra bit of thing that we need from him out of the five hole because that productivity out of the five right now has not been what we anticipated. Um, do you have any particular, your perfect off season in mind, do you have any particular uh, immediate go gets that come to mind? If it is a Robbie Ray, if it is a Stroman, uh, you know, or any particular, you know, bat that you may be looking at. Well, <clears throat> I just wrote a piece for Phillies nation it just published yesterday. It's a speculative piece. It wasn't based on any room. Rumors, but uh, my get was Jackie Bradley Jr. And the reasoning for me, I've been a JBJ fan from his college days, but he's an average hitter. Offensively, he's an average producer. He had an all-star year in 2016. Uh, last year was his high water mark as far as stolen bases. But what JBJ does is he is just a lockdown 
highlight film in center field. He's phenomenal. And he is. I mean, and he, he plays a really difficult ballpark to play center field in too. And if fans who you know who only look at maybe pull up his stats, you know, and look at the home runs, RBIs, and batting average, not gonna, they're, they're not going to be excited by JBJ. But if you go and look at some of his highlight reels, pull them up on YouTube, watch watch him actually play the game every day. Now, last night, it would have been a good, bad time. I write about <laughs> him on Sunday. Then he comes up on national TV and has a boneheaded base run and play last night to kind of cost the uh, Red Sox against the Dodgers. But this man is a phenomenal – I saw – I'm old enough that I got to see the entire career of Gary Maddox here. <clears throat> and he was <clears> – <throat> what the Phillies had every day for 10 years in center field was uh, you, you penned Gary Maddox into the lineup in center field. And every day you got quality center field play, very frequently highlight film play. The guy was a gold glove winner for something like – I'd have to look it up eight, nine years in a row, maybe 10 years in a row. Um, JBJ is that quality defender. And if you, for me, if you were able to swing a deal like that, and I don't think he's a free agent after next season and the Red Sox have other pieces. They have Ben Intendi, who is a fantastic defensive outfielder who can just easily slide over to center field. Mookie Betts could probably play center field, but he's already a gold glove right fielder. So they may just, be able to slide Ben Intendi over to center, put one of their, they got a couple of big boppers in the minor leagues who aren't great fielders, but you put them in front of the green monster in left field and just let them bash away. Uh, sign a, 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 a half decent bat to play left field for you. You can find that kind of bat out there. So I think with him being a free agent after next season and with other options there to, that they can uh, p- potentially plug in their lineup if you can get the Red Sox what they need, which is a little bit of pitching, then you might get them to jump at a guy like JBJ. <clears throat> that was what I was gearing towards in my you know, perspective, if you will, my my speculative article at Phillies Nation yesterday. Use a Medina, you know, use a uh, maybe Pavetta. Uh, use of Vinny Velasquez, you know, throw these names at them and, and see if anything bites. <clears throat> For me, then, if you go into next season with a uh, McCutcheon and Harper on the, the corners and JBJ in center, I'm not even worried about my outfield. That's a phenomenal defensive outfield, athletic, um, experienced. Um, you know, I, I would, I would love that. Uh, so. Uh, if you can't tell, I'm a JBJ fan, and he's like, <laughs> if I'm the GM, I'm calling Dave Dombrowski <laughs> up, and I'm saying, look, you know, this is what I'd like. What can we talk about? Um, aside from that, you know, the arms are. I mean, they always need a lefty. You know, I think Robbie Ray is the, is a strikeout left-hander. How high, you know, did it did it to the uh, D-backs expect you to go? Uh, now, would you think that taking on the contract of a Grenke in that and taking the contract in its entirety would be more enticing to lessen that that prospect haul in what would be a Robbie Ray deal as well for the two of them? You know, me personally, you know, I'm an all in guy. So Grenke is having a, you know, he's having a very strong year. He's going to pitch mean, forever. That guy just knows how to pitch. The problem with with Grunke, I think it's well known in the, the in the markets. lesser, yeah, the, in the lesser baseball sir, uh, uh, in, in the deeper baseball uh, knowledge base. You know, the fans who just look at the lines might not know this, but yeah, he has the anxiety issues. Now, but he's also pitched in L.A., so he was in L.A. for something like four years, three or four years. Pitched with the Dodgers for three years, with the yeah, Angels. It wasn't- until he was tipping pitches in the postseason, it became a problem. Yeah, he he can pitch in a big market. Now, you know, Philly's a different animal. I mean, sure. you know, here we eat our young. You know, if you, <laughs> if he throws a couple bad outings, you know, I hope he isn't listening to sports radio. But he's he's a phenomenal pitcher. I mean, there's no doubt about his talent. And what you're talking about here now is. Are you going to take on? He, he's basically owed, I think it's seventy million over the next two years, thirty-five million each yep. year. Uh, they they have the money, you know. So he's he's going to 
to be 36 and 37. So it, it really comes down to do you believe if you get Zach Greinke, like the real Zach Greinke, the way he's he's pitched really every year. Uh, I think he had one bad year or down year in the last dozen. If you get that Zach Greinke for the two years at 70 million, then I think you absolutely go for it. Uh, um, the, you know, the old the old saying when it's not your money is it's just money. Right? It's just money. So spend that 35 million a year because he's going to be an ace. Uh, now you got Grunky and Noel at the top of the rotation, and you get Robbie Ray with that. Now you got a legit one, two, three. Um, now you can play with an Arietta as your four or five for next year. You can have a Zach Eflin as your number four next year. So, yes, I, my, my answer would be yes. I mean, can That's it all blow up on you if Grunky, you know, gets hurt? Yes, it can. But uh, oh, those you got to make well. moves like that. To, to, if you really want to step up and become a championship contender, those are the moves you try to make. Absolutely. I And that's something like we talk about all the time in studio here, uh, me and some of our other baseball guys. What what would it take to, to pry both of them you know, away? And, and that, to me, continues to be an, an interesting conversation for both points that we've just discussed there. Um, so that's definitely a team. And plus, there are outfielders over there that we could probably take half their roster right now and, and just kind of supplant them in Philadelphia and be good to go. Um, but they're an interesting trade uh, trade partner for, for the Phillies for certain um, and some, something to watch out for. Um, let's go to a final thought here before we sign off on this one for in cap. We trust uh, you have any kind of interesting stats or any type of, uh, or just an ad piece as to where again, we can find you. <clears throat> well, the, the, always, it's always Phillies nation. So, uh, you know, the best place for them to look at, look for me is the, our Twitter feed and our Facebook feed at Phillies Nation. And the website is philliesnation.com. So I, I write pretty much every day. Um, if I'm writing, I'm, I'm coming up with things. So, uh, I mean, I'm doing 40, you know, pieces a month. So you're going to find something new from me, but it's not just me. You know, like I said, uh, we have a really good uh, editorial director in Tim Kelly who puts out a lot of interesting stuff. He also does a, a sort of a mini podcast every day, um, most days anyway. And we also have other staff writers who are coming out with things. We have uh, uh, Larry Shank, who most Phillies fans know as the Baron. Yeah. He was a longtime Phillies employee, Phillies historian. Uh, he does a minor league update piece every day with Phillies Nation. So uh, there's a lot, a lot that they can enjoy. Enjoy a Phillies Nation if they're not already following us. I would advise them to do so. Uh, and follow me at Matthew Vizi. Um, I'm always tweeting out baseball related items, Phillies related items. That's probably 95% <laughs> of what I put out. So, yeah, for sure. Definitely give, uh, like I said, give their website a follow and subscribe. Uh, and then certainly if you are on Twitter, which most of our listeners are, uh, definitely follow Matt if you are not already doing so. He is a, he's certainly a quality Phillies and baseball as a whole follow. Um, just a quick reminder from our sponsor, Just Food. It's 215-794-FOOD. That's 215-794-3663. Treat yourself. Take it home. If you are in the Bucks County area and looking for catering services or just an in-shop for a lunch, you can always head in. It's right above Peddler's Village if you guys are familiar with the area. Again, it is Just Food, 215-794-3663. Treat yourself. Take it home. You can always follow me. I am... Shane, the host of Encap We Trust, uh, at Shane underscore Mead. And then you can follow the podcast at ANY Podcast. Also subscribe to our website. We are not writing 40 pieces a month, but that is certainly a goal one day. Uh, it is www.alwaysnextyearpodcast.com. Matt, it has been awesome having you on. I do appreciate it, sir. Uh, hopefully we can do this again sometime. Shane, thanks. I appreciate it anytime. All right, sir. You take care. Go, Phils. With the wind But if Mickey Flynn should ever fight me I'll throw me call a shit all behind me And square off on that son of a bitch again He cracked open a rib or two He beat me so they through and through And so she over my unconscious reign I won me healthy sheriff fights Well lucky son still happy life Since Mickey Flynn beat me dumb and lame